The Emerging Times is all about, um, it's all about a few questions we've been asking ourselves uh, at first at the Herald Tribune and um, uh, since then, since I left the paper. Um, it's, uh, for instance, questions like, what is a crisis? Um, if you look at global headlines for the past four or five years, without a doubt, the term that predominates those headlines has been the term crisis. Well, for Louis XVI and his court, um, the French Revolution was a crisis. It was a philosophical, it was a political, it was a social, it was an economic crisis. Uh, for the third estate and the bourgeoisie, it was a very welcome paradigm shift. So for two-thirds of humanity right now, um, what we're going through is not exactly a crisis, because either things are going uh, not so well, but they've been not going well for quite some time now, or they're getting better. And so we keep talking about... Um, we keep talking about, inaptly, about countries um, emerging, the emerging world. But the truth of the matter is that um, the countries that we call uh, emerging are a group of countries that have little to do with one another. Uh, what is emerging is a new, is a new paradigm. Uh, it's the first time, you can call it many things. Some people call it um, multipolarization. Some people call it um, the emergence of a number of countries. Um, some, another way you could phrase it is it's very simply, it's the first time in 500 years that white men from Western Europe and North America are not alone calling all the shots in this world. The thing is, though, that while the new actors uh, have taken, uh, are taking on a new role um, in the world at the global table, at the, 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 in this, taking a new role in this global conversation, the West is still very much monopolizing the narrative of globalization. Hence this problem with the term crisis as a depiction of what's happening. So to hear from the rest of the world, from new players, exactly how they see uh, what's happening and the evolution of the world, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome on stage Dr. José Ramos Horta. Please join me. Dr. Ramos Horta um, was the youngest diplomat um, to work at the UN representing a country from the mid-70s. He was the awarded, he, was, he founded the independence movement of East Timor, um, which led to the country's independence. <clears throat> he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996 for his work in uh, finding a peaceful resolution to the issue, the issues in East Timor. Um, he was first the foreign minister of uh, Timor-Leste, then went on to become the prime minister and has been running the country now for the past five years um, until recently as president. Um, under his watch, uh, East Timor has, uh, in the past five years, experienced double-digit growth. It's one of, uh, you'll see in an article that just recently came out in The Economist, um, has joined the small group of 10 countries with the fast, the, the largest, the top growth rates in the world. Um, it uh, will be joining uh, the ASEAN uh, with the full support of its former foe, uh, Indonesia next year, and it will be hosting in uh, 2014 the, the uh, Congress of Lusophone Countries. Dr. Horta, uh, beyond all his past achievements, has recently co-founded a group of former heads of state from all around Asia called the APRC, which stands for Asia Peace and Reconciliation Council. Um, there's something very Emerging Times-esque about the very creation of the APRC. Indeed, 
in, in the depiction I have here of the, this new body um, that aims to fight for the <laughs> peace and reconciliation. Um, it says it's an Asian, it's a, a group of, of uh, heads of state to tackle peace and reconciliation issues in Asia. The fact of the matter is that it goes well beyond Asia, the, the, the issues that you're tackling. Indeed, among the first three issues that you will be looking at are the resolution of the, uh, the conflicts and, and the peace process in Burma. There will be the South China Seas conflict, and there will be as well um, Afghanistan and post-US military presence in Afghanistan. And so this is the first time in history, the first time in a very long time indeed, that Asian representatives, representatives, heads of state, are taking on this role. And so my first question to you, Dr. Horta, is, is there an Asian way of doing diplomacy? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Maybe before I uh, answer the question, I, I need to issue a clarification. Um, I have been appointed uh, recently an Under Secretary General of, of the UN with a sp specific mandate, a Special Representative of Secretary General of the United Nations for Guinea-Bissau in West Africa. So whatever I say here, uh, I will take... Uh, I'll, I already actually began my work. Uh, I was in New York just l last week. But I actually will be moving physically uh, to the region in February, second week. <laughs> Whatever I say here is still uh, without uh, the head of the new uh, 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 mission uh, as a special representative of Secretary General. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, I will be speaking uh, uh, maybe in abstract <laughs> about uh, the Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council uh, agenda. No uh, one uses Twitter here, so you can <laughs> you're in safe grounds. So, uh, because for many, many years, you know, I've been very much uh, an independent thinker. And um, even as president of my own country, I wrote opinion pieces on uh, conflicts ranging from uh, Afghanistan for the Wall Street Journal to Syria, Libya for Huffington Post, Daily Beast, etc. But uh, uh, as a, a special secretary general on a specific issue, I'm not supposed to have an opinion on other matters. But, uh, because the Secretary General is very generous, he allows me the flexibility <laughs> to, uh, uh, to speak uh, on these issues before I land in uh, West Africa. So... Uh, you have a few more days. <laughs> so, uh, qu sorry, what's your question again? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, you're taking... This is the first time up to now when uh, diplomats took on peace and reconciliation issues it was Western diplomats. It was Europeans and Americans. This is the first time that a group of Asian diplomats gets together and says, we are going to work for the resolution of conflicts and for peace, not just in Asia, uh, but worldwide. And indeed, you could, you, could say, you could claim that Burma is a local issue, certainly, but South China Seas and certainly Afghanistan and the future of Afghanistan are not Asia issues. So is there an Asian way of doing diplomacy? The Asian uh, Peace and uh, Reconciliation Council was created, launched in September last year in a meeting in Bangkok uh, that brought together uh, people like uh, former Vice President of Indonesia, Yusuf Kala, who was very, very instrumental or key driver with current president Susilo Bambangwidiono in the peace efforts in Aceh, bringing to an end the long-running conflict in Aceh 
one of the most so far successful peacemaking uh, effort. It brought together also former Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, Dr. Badawi, uh, Foreign Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister of Singapore, Professor Jayakumar, uh, and the others, former presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers from Pakistan, India, uh, from all over Asia, and the, the group keeps growing. And uh, the idea of uh, establishing this group is to offer a second track diplomacy. It's a non-state entity, but also not a typical NGO, because uh, many of the people in the group are, like former Vice President Yusuf Kala, still leader of uh, uh, his party, still prominent in the country, and like many others, you know. Uh, and we, uh, uh, for several months, a year or two, we have been discussing uh, the need for Asian leaders uh, to rise up to the challenge of addressing some of the seemingly intractable, insurmountable uh, challenges in Asia. We hear all the time talk about the rising Asia, but Asia can rise and fall if Asia, Asian leaders, Asian people do not face some of the greatest challenges, like nuclearization. Asia has not the greatest number of nuclear weapons, but it has the greatest number of countries possessing nuclear weapons. And unlike in Europe, where you don't have a France and the UK pointing the nuclear weapons on each other, in Asia, we point nuclear weapons at each other. And actually, we don't have nuclear weapons in Asia facing elsewhere the region. And um, then you have uh, some of the disputes like South China Seas, but my view, South China Seas uh, disputes could be one of the easiest to resolve compared with the land border and other sea border disputes in South Asia, etc. Then on top of it, you have uh, uh, post-2014 NATO-US withdrawal from Afghanistan. It will leave behind Pakistan, India, Iran, and others that have to deal with the, the post-NATO-US withdrawal. So we thought we have to come together with our experience, connections, uh, network, uh, developing also partnerships with uh, extra Asian uh, uh, think tanks. We have the support of Harvard University, Professor Paul Kennedy, and uh, others uh, to try to start tackling these issues in an Asian way, if there can be an uh, Asian way, because that's also a bit, uh, I think, poetic. Uh, and, uh, but there are certain uh, styles or certain approaches that uh, can be different from the more American, European uh, center diplomacy. Can you give us examples? Well, um, I wouldn't uh, venture into uh, 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 examples, but um, uh, look at the case of Myanmar, Burma. Many would claim that uh, the changes in Myanmar have been brought about by uh, sanctions. I personally, for a long time, for 10 years, I have been extremely skeptical about sanctions. Economic financial sanctions on impoverished countries have been the easiest tools for the West to impose because it brings no cost to the West itself. Uh, when you impose sanctions on uh, uh, Myanmar or other uh, impoverished countries, what is the cost for the West? Minimum. Uh, 
<coughs> if you were to impose sanctions on some more formidable economies that still not terribly different in their behavior from the more impoverished countries, it would have cost. So it's a bit uh, cynical, uh, uh, my view in that regard. So for a long time I uh, advocated uh, engagement with um, whoever is in the country because actually uh, one, uh, it was a French businessman um, based in Rangoon, Yangon, who visited me in his team a few years ago. He has business there and he said, within the confines of my business, my factory, I do have responsibility to the people working with me. I give them salaries, their human dignity, human rights are respected. Outside the gates, I have no control. But if I'm forced to close down the factory, they lose everything they have within the confines of the, of the factory and outside. So, while it is politically correct and maybe morally correct to argue for sanctions uh, on countries like Myanmar, uh, in practical terms, it never really affected those in power. It did affect many thousands of Burmese. Second, uh, so then you have uh, the ASEAN approach. For a long time, for many years, ASEAN sought first to admit Myanmar into ASEAN instead of excluding ASEAN. So the first step strategy was several years ago to embrace Myanmar, bringing it into ASEAN in spite of the absolute uh, lack of uh, conditions, criteria, in terms of finan laws, financial, financial banking system not to mention uh, political conditions in the country. With much frustration, but a lot of patience on the part of ASEAN leaders, they began to uh, see incremental uh, changes in the unsaid, unseen attitude of the military. Everybody was surprised when Suu Kyi was uh, released, and some claim it was uh, the West. I would say maybe both. The military themselves were tired of years and years of uh, this tension. Uh, because in practical terms, you know, we are all human beings. And uh, some people in a conflict, whether leaders or not, at some point in time, you are psychologically, emotionally drained. You try to have a normal country, a normal life. Uh, so that was the ASEAN uh, approach, which was not very much appreciated by the West, in that ASEAN countries refused to impose sanctions on Myanmar, because for a look at Thailand, you know, uh, unlike United States that does not have a border with, uh, with Myanmar, if you impose sanctions on Myanmar, Thailand would be the first to suffer, because it has direct border, it has uh, gas supplied by Myanmar to Bangkok, etc. There's um, several elections are coming up in, uh, in Asia. Um, in um, Malaysia, um, there's, uh, there will be elections that should be held before April. In uh, Cambodia, we have here the head of the uh, Cambodian opposition and uh, uh, one, uh, one of the uh, foremost representatives of the opposition movement in Cambodia. There will be elections there in, uh, in July. Um, what is the APRC standing for in terms of the, the, the way these elections uh, should take place? Well, um, we uh, decided that um, actually right now uh, I should be in uh, Jakarta at the first, uh, the group was created in September as I said, and uh, right now we are, the group is gathering in Jakarta. The first- The APRC. Sorry, yeah, the APRC. Uh, the first time uh, we are having a, such a meeting uh, in Jakarta, 
uh, brainstorming on South China Sea dispute. Mm -hmm. And um, the topics, issues that we picked uh, are South China Seas, uh, maybe if the Thai authorities are interested, uh, deal with the issue of that shrine, temple, uh, on, the in, border between. on the border between Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, the problems uh, in the south of Thailand. Uh, and um, Afghanistan, uh, we don't really deal with uh, elections issues because there are so many electoral bodies, uh, watchdogs, uh, national, regional, international. We deal with some, we propose to address issues that uh, till now uh, either no one is dealing with, like the South China Sea dispute, there is no uh, mediation or facilitation mechanism, uh, and actually no one is looking at the post-2014 Afghanistan. It will be Asians who will have to pick up the pieces. And that in itself is a huge agenda. I think, I think everyone's very happy that the Asians will be picking up the issue. Um, the special representative of the United Nations uh, in Guinea-Bissau, whom you're replacing, is leaving because the military there have uh, voiced uh, irritation about uh, the way he was uh, uh, too, too outspoken. Um, I hope that uh, in the coming months and years they don't come to, I think they will come to regret um, the, the gentleman from Rwanda who's about to leave office to see this place too. Thank you so very much, Thank, Dr. Thank you. Horta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.